that kind of energy, um, we're not supposed to utilize that. It's very destructive, and it's not meant for you. That's the voice of Navajo Diné storyteller, Sunny Dooley. She's today's guest on the special episode of Press the Button, a Plowshares Fund podcast dedicated to nuclear policy and national security. And now, here are your co-hosts, Michelle Dover and Tom Kalina. Welcome back to Press the Button for our 69th episode. This week, we're doing something a little different. That's right, Michelle. In recognition of the 75th anniversary of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings, we're taking a break from our usual programming. That means no early warning or Q&A, but don't worry, they'll be back next week. Instead, we're going to give you a conversation with Sunny Dooley, a Navajo Diné storyteller who charts out how the atomic bombs exist in her community's history. I was really moved by our conversation and hope you find it as special as I did. And we have a special bonus episode about Leslie Bloom's new book, Fallout, where she explores the history of the Hiroshima bombing and how it was reported. You can find it in your feed wherever you get your podcasts. As always, please click subscribe and give us a rating. And if you find yourself talking about Hiroshima with friends and family this week, please let them know about our show. You can help spread awareness about nuclear dangers, how far we've come in addressing them, and how much farther we still need to go. We really appreciate it. With that, let's get into today's episode. Joining me today is Sunny Dooley, a Navajo Diné storyteller who collects, learns, and retells the oral tradition of the Diné Hojonje Hane, in English, the Navajo Blessing Way stories. Sunny and I met through her work as a founding member of Ways of Knowing, a multimedia project about Navajo resilience to protect health, tradition, and land after enduring extensive uranium mining beginning in the late 1940s and lasting until the 1970s. Sunny is the inaugural recipient of Plowshare Fund's Estrin Award, and she recently published a piece in Scientific American on how the seeds for COVID's devastation in her community were sown decades ago. Sunny, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. Thank you, Michelle. I'm happy to be here today. As you and I have talked about, this week is the 75th anniversary of the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki on August 6th and 9th. They remain the first and only two uses of nuclear weapons in wartime. And it's, it's hard to know how many people were killed as a result of the bomb, though estimates in the four-month period after the detonations range from 130,000 to 250,000 people. You live in New Mexico, the area where the bomb was designed, built, and tested, and where the uranium was mined. How do you feel the echoes of the atomic bomb? I think the echoes of that amount of destruction is still being heard to this very day, 75 years later, in all of the places where uranium mining is taking place. The legacy of the destruction of earth and water and air And subsequently, all the people, birds, animals, reptiles, insects, shrubbery that exists and grows and lives in those places still carry that legacy. So those bombs that were dropped, I cannot even begin to imagine the trauma that the people have experienced in Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the preceding generations. Um, how they are living with it, because here on Navajo land, where there are over 500 abandoned uranium mines, we're living with a lot of contamination. And this is just one area on Earth where I visibly can see the destruction. I haven't been to other places 
where this particular industry um, of uranium mining and then eventually becoming some kind of nuclear weapon of any sort and even nuclear energy being utilized to produce power for electricity or other purposes, the echoes of that waste is still here, very apparent in New Mexico. I think one of the places where we don't really ever think about it echoing is in the professional payments of what people earn in this industry. You think of scientists of every persuasion being hired by all of the laboratories um, here in New Mexico. You know, our state pretty much is funded by this industry. So the echoes of those two bombs dropping are still very vibrant and are heard every single day and night in this land that I live in. I grew up near one of the sites in Washington State where the plutonium was produced. And, you know, it was interesting until I began working on this issue, I, I on the issue of nuclear weapons, I didn't really think about what the effects were on the community in kind of a coherent narrative way, right? Like I knew about the spills or the challenges out at the site in the in the containment. I knew what some of the legacy pieces were, but I never, it was always background to me. What was it like for you? How does this history play out in, in your community and in your life? So my father was born in 1918. And when the bomb ex- was tested in New Mexico, he was in his mid-30s. And he said that he saw the explosion. My father did not tell me where he saw the explosion from. I don't know if he saw it from his homestead, which would have been on top of the mesa in an area that is called Chejiltra. Or if he saw the explosion while he was working on the railroad. And there is a railroad that goes south of Albuquerque to the city of Berlin and across. I don't know where he was at when he saw the explosion. But he did tell me that all of the medicine people, the medicine men in his area, knew that something catastrophic had happened. And they were very well aware of the fact that the covenant rock or the covenant stone or the covenant placement of an object had fallen in Chaco Canyon right around the time of the explosion. And my father said that all of the medicine men were very saddened. Many of them cried because they knew that the covenant that they made at Chaco Canyon, where a lot of the indigenous people of this area still hold sacred and still practice many of their spiritual offerings it's still a vibrant place for us it's just not a national historic park they knew that the world had changed forever and that story began thousands of years before the spanish came in before the French came in, before the English came in, before North and South Hemisphere were divided into countries. Because these ancient places were vibrant and viable communities 
prior to any kind of contact. And so at some point in our Navajo evolution of living on Earth, we had gone and strayed away from what we call hojo, which is our way of finding a life that is holistically balanced between earth sphere and being in the entire universe. We are very well aware of all of the planets and the stars because we had a 24 year lunar calendar established. 24 year past, 24 year future. We knew the position of the full moon in each progressive season. We knew when the solstices, the equinoxes, and the midpoints in between would all transpire. We were aware of the regulations of time. And so when we took so many things out of context, we created a world that was unblessed. So on one side, we have hojo, which means whole, holistic, balanced. And then we have hojo, which means ruined, unbalanced, and not holistic. And so within these two sides, we messed up how we were living. And so we had to get back to that place that of balance. And so we learned a lot of really vital uh, lessons in that process. And at the end of that process, we said that we would not try to manipulate energetic forces that were more powerful than us. We also said that we would work intentionally to always maintain hojo balance and that we were not going to utilize our abilities, talents, and skills and abilities to be destructive, that we would always work for it to be constructive for the harmony of all of us living there. And we made a covenant for that. And there it was placed at Chaco and all of the people that live there moved away and went to their respective areas. And so time progressed on, the Spanish came in, the American government came in, and they just sort of, you know, revolved around us. But the Spanish really made a big indention into a lot of our cultures because they came in uh, with a very violent mandate to Christianize many of the indigenous people here in the Catholic Church. And they really prevented a lot of our traditional practices um, to go underground. And so we just maintained. And then, of course, you know, later on, you know, there was the discovery of gold once again in California. And so then the United States started expanding. And with all of this going on, us people, the Diné people, we're just trying to keep up. We're really literally trying to survive. And so when my father saw this explosion in Trinity, New Mexico, and then he sees his traditional practitioners that hold all of our ceremonies together cry and then they say that this is catastrophic we're never ever going to be like how we were again he was deeply affected by that and this all came to my attention when in seventh grade i decided because my teacher wanted me to choose a profession and I couldn't choose just one. And the ones that really spoke to me that I would be doing research on was 
either to be an archaeologist, an astronaut, or an architect. And um, I told my dad, this is what I would like to pursue. I said, this is what the teacher said. You need to do some research about what you want to do when you grow up. So I told these three options to my dad and to my mom. They just kind of thought about it and they just kind of looked at me. And um, my mother was the first one who said, the archaeology, the Ninikishieya do Nabigata. The one that you're saying archaeology, I don't think is gonna work because you're going to be bothering the sacred places and the sacred remains of our ancestors. That's you just don't do that. And then she said, Architect, that sort of sounds pretty good because your dad is really good at building hogans. And maybe that that can work out for you. But I know culturally that a Navajo woman does not make her own home. That's the responsibility of her husband. And they kind of laughed about it. And then my dad says, don't be an astronaut. Point blank like that. And I just kind of looked at him and I said, why? And then he said, because if you're going to be an astronaut, you have to use very powerful energy to get up into the moon and beyond into the stars. Who knows if you'll be racing through the Milky Way and that kind of energy, um, we're not supposed to utilize that. It's very destructive and it's not meant for you. And he told me this whole story of his life. and. When I looked at him, I was like, you actually saw the atomic explosion? You know, and I at that time, they only had encyclopedias. There was no such thing as a computer. And so I remember I took to the library and got out the encyclopedia in. And then I looked at nuclear explosion and I thought, wow. That is, that is powerful. That is really powerful. And so I showed that to my dad and he said, yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. That's when that explosion happened at Trinity over in Chaco, where we had put up the covenant that we were not going to manipulate energy forces like that. That covenant fell down and so to this day we're still not sure what we do around really powerful energy like nuclear explosions and that story I think is more relevant today because many of the communities around the world where the uranium was mined for these kinds of inventions. We're now finally able to talk English to express our worldview of what has happened to us. And we don't need an interpreter anymore. Because many times it was a Navajo individual talking Navajo, incapable of speaking English. So there was an interpreter there. Who knows what got lost in that translation? This time we no longer have that interpreter. We've educated ourselves to know what we're talking about. And it still baffles me to know in the language that the nuclear people utilize to explain things. And what's interesting is that some of those words do not even begin to translate into my indigenous language. 
And so it's really difficult to understand what is going on with this industry. But then this is the first time it seems like we've been invited to speak about it in the same room. I wondered, you know, you, you mentioned about the uranium mines. How do the legacy of these bombs fit in the landscape of crises that we're seeing today for you in terms of the pandemic, in terms of the injustice, the inequality? So back when the mines were being mined, I think the very first uh, uranium was actually discovered on Navajo land, just on the surface of the land. There was an individual who came in and saw these yellow rocks and um, picked them up and, you know, turns out it was uranium. And a number of those Anglo individuals, you know, talked to Navajo sheep herders and said, wherever you see these rocks, take a note of it and then tell us where you find it. We'll be back in X amount of time. You can relay your findings. And so here in Navajo land, uranium is naturally occurring. I live in a community where uranium and arsenic are naturally available in the water. It's just in the water. There are some wells that don't have the arsenic and the uranium, so that water is usable. But most of the uranium mining took place further north of where I live. And if you think of Albuquerque, New Mexico on a map, And if you can see Flagstaff, Arizona on a map, north, northwest of Albuquerque, um, up towards the Shiprock area, all the way up to Monument Valley, Arizona and Monument Valley, Utah, there are a number of uranium mines right around uh, Grants, New Mexico, Mount Taylor. A mountain that is sacred to many of the indigenous people in this area, all around its foot base, uh, from the east, south, and west, there are uranium mines. That uranium mining was active all the way up into the 80s. And um, every now and then, you know, The companies under a new acronym come in and say, we want to restart this up. And, you know, if you look at the city of Grants, it's economically enormously depleted. And there's so many people who have died from this particular mining. And then you go over to Flagstaff, Arizona, and about a month ago, one of the judges ruled in favor of the company to restart up uh, the uranium mining right there on the southern edge of Grand Canyon, right near, you know, the Grand Canyon National Monument, right near Red Butte, which is once again another sacred landscape uh, geography for many of the tribes that live in the Grand Canyon and right on top of the Grand Canyon. So all of these places to this day are inhabited. I always think sometimes maybe people think that the only places that are inhabited are major cities that have streetlights and sidewalks and um, city parks. And as indigenous people, we don't organize ourselves in that kind of a geographical space. So... If you are Wallapai or Supai living in the Grand Canyon and this uranium mine is up here at the top and they're mining it, whatever waste that's produced from that mine, it's coming down the streams and the springs and the watersheds that you're going to be drinking from. It's going into the Colorado River. 
And the Colorado River produces most of the water for Arizona, Nevada, and California. And so this is an isolated contamination in just one little small area. It's vast. And so when I think about your question, there's almost, it, it's so hard to explain just how huge the imprint of it is. And then to consider that that was never, ever considered by the people who want to produce this kind of quote unquote economic development. And when I think about it in terms of what we're experiencing right now with this worldwide pandemic, we want to maintain an economy that was in existence previous to the pandemic. And I think the pandemic has shown us very easily how interconnected we are. Money is showing us how interconnected we are. Because the reason why toilet paper couldn't come back onto our store shelves readily was because wood pulp came from two different countries, the United States and Canada. We can't source all of the plastic chemicals needed to accommodate antibacterial whites. Certain ingredients come from faraway places. And with that example, what I'm trying to say is just as you activate a mine and it contaminates earth, water, air, and all of the living species. How are you going to have a viable economy when you're killing all of this? When you're debilitating all of this? When you are leaving a legacy of defeat? And to me, there's nothing powerful about that. For me, this pandemic is showing us that we have to redefine what it means as five-fingered human people, what is viable, what is sustainable, and what is going to guarantee our evolution for the next, I used to think 500 years, seven generations. I'm just thinking, are we going to make it through? the next 50 years because we were being isolated and, you know, six months later, you know, I've always wanted to use this word in public. We have just gone amok. We're just running around like chickens without heads, not knowing what to do. And a lot of that is because right on the surface, we realize how unequal the playing field has been. And it's the first time we really have to ask ourselves the questions that are really difficult to answer. And I think that if anyone really wants to find out about what racism is, look at what we've done to the earth. Look at the most contaminated area within your community. And that's where you begin to start answering the questions. Because none of us are going to survive until we begin to clean the wound that has been festering for 75 years or longer. Sunny, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and your time with us today. I will be directing our audience. They, I really hope they read the piece that you wrote in Scientific American. Is there anywhere else you hope that they look as they begin their journeys 
in better understanding these stories? I would like for them to be guided to look inward. You don't need to read about me or what I do or anything like that. I want you to find that hurting place in your community, wherever you live. And I want you to visit that place and just be with it for a while. And in whatever capacity you practice your spirituality, express it there and learn from it on how to heal it. That's what I would really want everyone to do. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you, Michelle. Thanks for listening to Press the Button. This podcast is produced by Delphine Vigil, Zach Brown, Derek Sender, and Will Lowry. Sound design by Derek Sender. Audio engineering by Derek Sender and Will Lowry. Our theme song is by Lyrics Born and the Poets of Rhythm, sampled with kind permission. Additional music by San Francisco-based bands 17 Evergreen and the Society of Rockets. To continue the dialogue and support our work, visit plowshares.org.